Hello and welcome back and that is right today we want to return to the subject of Thunderbolt docking stations. Now I say return to, I've talked about uh, Thunderbolt docking stations on this channel quite a lot. Indeed within the last month I talked about one and that was the QGene, uh, QGene Thunderbolt docking station. For those who didn't watch that video it was me talking about how I'd been, you know, looking around to upgrade in my setup there. And before I'd even started looking, some company had reached out and said, can you do us a favor? Can you review our product on your video? Be as honest as you want. And I was. And I thought we'd start quite using it. I thought, you know what? That was a really good docking station. And then this happened. I was reached out to by a company called Arico. And again, I do get contacted by brands here on the channel. It's quite normal with YouTube, isn't it? But most brands I do either politely decline or say I really don't talk about that kind of product. But this product here, along with another external docking station that I've reviewed for another video, was something I really wanted to test. Because this docking station has one thing, one little thing, that sets it out from all the other others. The, the Arico Thunderbolt 3 S2 has got two M2 NVMe slot inside. It's got all of those other ports that we talked about, it even covers 8K as well. And we'll talk more about that later on. But it does all of that and has two M2 NVMe slots inside, not SATA, crucially, M2 NVMe. That means that this docking station has a huge amount of potential to upgrade your workflow there. And later on in the video, after we've unboxed it and taken a good long look at it, we're going to be bench testing it with this, a Sabrent SSD that we're going to be looking at later on. So, let's talk about this. It's a Thunderbolt 3 docking station. Who is a Thunderbolt 3 docking station aimed at? Because with this uh, arriving on the scene, the S2 arriving at about $260, up to about 300 nicker flying around. For a docking station that doesn't have drives inside, that's a lot of money. Who is it aimed at? Well, if you are someone that does photography off-site or videography off-site and you have like an office or a studio that you do your main work in, your post-production in elements and stuff like that, but crucially, you have a laptop or a MacBook or whatever that you take under your arm on the go and go over there and do some stuff, but you still want a workstation feel, this can be something like this can be very, very useful. It allows you to create in one area of your office a setup for multiple displays, keyboards, mice, Thunderbolt peripherals, storage devices, and more audio in and out and network connectivity, all connected into a box like this on your desk. And then this box sits there waiting for you to come back with all of the devices connected with your little MacBook. You plop the MacBook down, connect it with a single Thunderbolt cable, and that's it. You can now work on a keyboard mouse setup with all your monitors. You've got all of the stuff there from the Mac completely accessible. And then when you're ready, shut down the lid, disconnect it, and off you go again. That's one of the two main uses for a docking station. Second use, of course, is to take this with you wherever you go. But then the portableness of this compared with all the other peripheral devices I mentioned do differ wildly. So although I mentioned there's different kinds of users because some of these MacBooks and indeed Windows thinner laptops that are running on Ultrabooks have very few ports and they're overly reliant on USB Type-C ports to do everything. So you've got a port that can do everything but not many ports are actually physically available and that is where a device like this comes in. Now where this then makes it even better is twofold. One, it is the idea that it supports that 4K display. Let's get the thumbnail sorted. It supports uh, an 8K and a 4K display via DisplayPort and Thunderbolt there, or USB displays as well. So you can utilize it to have multiple displays that you connect via that single display Thunderbolt device you're using there, a Thunderbolt MacBook. But more crucially, because this has got storage capabilities with two M2 NVMe slots inside, and I will show them to you in just a moment, the result is that not only are you bolting on uh, KVM, keyboard, video, mouse, and network peripherals, but you're also bolting on a backup device. You can utilize this, connect it, and then back up via a single click if you choose, all of the shoots, the raw footage and all that onto the storage media inside this, or more importantly, on your laptop, 
you might only have the on-the-go projects, the live footage, the last 30 days of on-the-go live scratch disc type stuff. Whereas this will have your archive of warm data. Your hot data is what you just recorded. Your cold data is your long-term backups. But your warm data is the data in the middle that you might need that introduction, might need that template, might need the intro, might need those credit scenes, might need that after effect, that music, all of that information that you need for projects. But you don't really want to bulk up your MacBook, your laptop, even your desktop PC with. So this presents a very interesting alternative where all of your storage is on the same device that's connecting all your peripherals, but the main hub of your operation, your MacBook or your laptop, is still hugely portable. That was why I was intrigued by this device. Now, this is a hell of an introduction to that, isn't it? But I would also argue that this isn't perfect and there are a couple of things even when i ran down the specs when i was getting my storyboard for this video done and my script before it arrived that i wasn't in love with so before we go any further before i start talking non-stop about what i like let's talk about two things that i don't like about this device because i think it's important that you understand that this is a device that isn't going to please everyone now the first downer is this this enormous power brick. This power brick is bigger in volume than the original thing. Yes, it's narrower, but in overall uh, height, width, and depth, it's bigger. And that's because it's 120 watts. 120 watts is just too big for this enclosure. They could have made it bigger and stuffed in a 120 watt custom build PSU internally, but the fact still remains if they did that, it would generate a tremendous amount of heat that may slightly affect those 8K displays, but would definitely affect those storage media bays there on the base. So it's really important that it's an external power brick, but it's massive. And those of you in that second camp that I described that are going to be taking this and your portable laptop or whatever on the go are going to chuffing height this power brick. It effectively doubles the transit space needed. The second thing about this that I'm not overly keen on is the network port. Now, the fact that there is a network port is my chef kiss. Of course, I want my USBs, I want my Thunderbolts, I want my display port, I want my storage, I want my network. But it's only one gigabit Ethernet. It's 100 or 109 megabytes per second. Like any network port on any device, it's exactly the same. But there are Thunderbolt to 10 gigabit Ethernet adapters out there. You could get a thousand meg, um, a megabyte, not megabit, network connection there for your network, and then have maybe a 10G NAS to back up to, or other 10G peripherals. Maybe you're an office that runs a 10 net, 10G network anyway. And having this to bridge the gap between your one GBE MacBook that happens to have Thunderbolt 3 can now connect to a 10G network would have been great. But unfortunately, you've only got 1G on this. And I feel like it's a weird bottleneck on this system when they've clearly done a lot of work to make the most out of this chipset. Additionally, there are Thunderbolt to 10 GBE controllers out there from companies like Quantia. More so than that, USB to 2.5 GBE and 5 GB adapters are incredibly common. You can pick up a USB to 2.5G adapter for as little as 20 to 25 nicker. So the idea for me that they can give me all of these USB ports that I'll touch on in a moment, but not give me at least even 2.5G is a real bummer. But that's enough negatives. Let's talk about the positives once again. First and foremost, we talked about it already, but boom, there is a display port that outputs 60 frames per second, 8K. Obviously, it can scale down and it's backwards compatible, but that is great stuff there. Additionally, we've got a couple more US, uh, USB-C Thunderbolt ports there, one of which, of course, is going to be the connection that goes into your MacBook, but the other one there is a visual output as well. So you've got your 4K outputs and 8K outputs as well got our power connector there and that 120 watt uh, PSU um, 60 watt plus 15 watt of that 
goes into uh, to output for the rest of the device. The rest of the power that goes into this is separate for the running of each of those individual ports. Now on this side, we've got an audio in and out port there, so you can attach um, uh, a headset with a microphone that can go straight into this. But on top of that, these are all USB ports. We have a USB 3.2 Gen 2 port, so 10 gigabit per second or 1,000 megs. We have another one of those USB 2 Gen 2 ports there, but a USB Type A. So again, that's 1,000 megs there. And two of those legacy USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, which give us 500 megs or 5 gigabits per second. So plenty of connectivity there on this docking station. On top of that, we've got our ports in this aluminium external enclosure here not only is the whole thing ridged all the way along the top there to enable uh, air to pass over the dissipating heat plate but as you can see from the little holes there is an internal fan inside this system to cool the nvmes inside space inside is a little limited i'm going to show you in a moment if you want to take advantage of something like a heat sink which we'll touch on in just a moment but that fan, I'm assured, and I've not run this yet, is a quiet fan. Of course, we will check that when we do our SSD performance video, uh, half of the video, in just a moment. But for now, we can have a look inside. The accessories we get are, of course, the PSU. We, <coughs> forgive the cough, an external power connector. We have our screwdriver here for uh, removing the bottom plate. We have two lovely thick heat sink panels instructions and warranty information. Sorry for the break in recording. I'd forgotten how to drink coffee before this video and decided to knacker my throat. Carrying on, we've also got a USB Type-C cable that is a 40 gigabits per second connector there. So again, Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4, USB 4. This is what you wanna see. It's not a tremendously long cable, but to be frank, long cables at 40 gigabit don't really exist. They cap out, at least the Thunderbolt terms especially, at around five meters. And at that point, they cost a fortune. Plus, this is quite a good quality cable. It's definitely um, double bandwidth, and it is a fabric cable as well. Now, if we open this bad boy up, we can take a little look at the ports inside. We're only gonna install a single M2 SSD inside. I debated putting in two drives there, but I didn't want any kind of RAID uh, support inside to undermine any of the scoring that we're gonna be going with in a bit. So I wanted to use just a single drive inside in order to show the performance that it can do. Removing that panel, and again, lovely thickness there. That is gonna also assist heat dissipation. We can take a little look at the inside. And as you can see, we've got the two M2 NVMe connectors there, PCIe Gen 3 these are, so not Gen 4, but that should still be absolutely fine. And that little tiny silent heatsink there inside. Now, a couple of things before we go any further. Um, with those slots inside there, this is going to be a system where bandwidth is going to be negligible at all times. Now, you may hear people when they talk about Thunderbolt 3 or 4 or USB 4, they talk about that 40 gigabits per second performance barrier. That means 4,000 megabytes per second are connected and passable through this cable between the connected dock and your system. 4,000 megabytes per second. But even the most loosely versed in maths person knows that all of those ports we see here are way higher than 4,000 megs if you try to use all of them. And that's important because if you try to use all of these ports at once, it, you can use them, but they're all gonna be sharing 4,000 megs. To put that into perspective, these two ports here, of their own volition, if you wanted to get the full performance, if they are, if they are Gen 3 times 2, which I suspect they might be, maybe even Gen 1, then I think there's every possibility you're only gonna get one to 2,000 megs per SSD, something we'll find out later on. On top of that, each of those USBs we mentioned, we've got a 1,000 megs, a 1,000 megs, a 500 meg, and a 500 meg. So those, even if you max them, are 3,000 megabytes per second if you have a fast enough drive on their own. Indeed, the 8K and the Thunderbolt ports, what I'm saying is, that do bear in mind that even with a docking station like this, you'll be able to connect to myriad of devices, but the more devices you connect, 
the less likely you can fully saturate the potential connection of any one device. And that is not just with this device. That is all docking stations. So do bear that in mind. The other thing I'll touch on is how SSDs are installed inside this system. Because it's slightly different to other devices out there. So for example, this is the Sabrent Rocket 4 Plus. Great SSD and I've picked it specifically for this video. Not just because it's one of my top three rated M2 NVMEs that I ever talk about, if you've watched the channel before you know, but also because it has at the top that dissipating heat shield. I've not gone for a heat sink, a big metal panel. And I've certainly not gone for a chunky heat sink either. Again, available from Sabrent. Not even gone for an SSD that has a pre-attached heat sink such as the WD. The reason is because these SSDs go in the other way up. They go in facing the fan and the top there being the controller where all the data would live. Now, again, one goes face up, one goes face down. The one that faces up will look in like that, as you can see there. The other one is going to go in face down, as you can see. So bear that in mind with the connectors being the other way around. Now, had I gone ahead and purchased an SSD that has a heatsink attached, such as the WD Black, which is a really nice chunky heatsink, not only if I put it face up is it now too tall to shut the lid, but you can't even attempt to get it inside the downward facing one. It just simply won't go in and it's too tall to shut the lid. So bear that in mind. Go for an SSD that doesn't have a heatsink pre-attached. And again, the Sabrents always on offer. Generally, you can get them anywhere and they are really fast. They've upgraded the, MT, uh, the controller inside and the NAND particularly to 176 layer to get even more performance out of this. Now, you pop the drive inside. You can choose whether you want to use a heat dissipation panel because you want that to connect with the inside, but you can choose to do that or not. Or in my case, I can go ahead and use this drive that already has a heat shield to further improve the heat dissipation there quite rapidly. So we can go ahead and install that on there. Pop that from the top. Another interesting part of this, uh, dev uh, this device's design is when you put the panel back on, as you can see, because we're not screwing that drive down yet, what you do is put the drive in, angle the top and shut the lid and the screw holes that you use to attach that lid are what keep the m2 nvme down and as you can see it's not springing up you can go ahead shut that down and that's how easy it is to install a drive so again this is a docking station that allows us to have a greater degree of storage potential as well as all of those connections but for now let's take this uh, docking station here and what we're going to do is move it over to my test area there. We're gonna connect it via that Thunderbolt connection and see just what this bad boy can give us in terms of storage overall. Let's make our way over to the tests. Okay, so I've made my way onto the desktop and I've had a little bit of fun setting up our Arico Thunderbolt 3 uh, docking station with Drive. So as you can see there on screen, this is the official page. Also, if we make our way onto the My Computer page here, you'll see just a couple of drives are listed. That's my OS drive and an internal archive drive. And I know they're all red and full, but that's because of the my rotation of data. Ignore that for now. Also, if I open up Crystal Disk, you'll see that all there is is the two drives that are in side here being utilized the samsung 970 and that kingston there that is all that is connected but right now i have connected the docking station to my laptop via the 40 gigabits per second cable that's included and i've attached a whole manner of different devices so what i'm going to do now is power on the dock two seconds Now, as the dock begins to boot up, it's going to be really interesting to see how many of the devices I've connected are going to be recognized. I have connected um, an external M2 NVMe uh, external drive with a Samsung SN7700 inside, a SanDisk USB 3.1 Gen 2 uh, SSD. I've attached a GTEC external hard drive, 
<clears throat> I've attached a Sonnet 10 GBE to Thunderbolt adapter. I've attached a um, Wi-Fi 6 USB dongle. And, of course, there is that internal SSD. All of these have been connected to this docking station. So that is an enormous amount of drives and different devices connected to this single docking station that's connected to my laptop with just a single Thunderbolt connected cable. So as we can already see, the first drive has appeared and immediately a pile of other drives have appeared. This drive here is the SanDisk drive and if we go into properties, you'll be able to see it there. This is our SanDisk drive that we've connected. Actually, better yet, it would be a lot easier if we just go immediately into Crystal Disk and what we'll do is we'll refresh and rescan the drives and then all of these other drives will begin to appear. So immediately what we've got uh, if we have, if we move that just back to the previous page, that external SanDisk, we've got the external GTEC drive, we've got an external Arico drive there, and that is an external M2, and we've got that internal Sabrent that we attached earlier on. If we make our way in, this is still waiting to refresh, that's more fault of my own device, and even better, if we make our way into the network adapters, you can see that not only do I ha have I run in the original Wi-Fi that I was utilizing, but we've also got the Sonic 10 GBE to Thunderbolt adapter connected, and we also have a standard 1 GBE cable connected to that. That is a huge bevy of connectivity there. I'm just gonna close uh, Crystal Disk. It's clearly not having fun trying to incrementally attach all of these drives. But we'll reopen it there, get that open on there, and see what a rescan does for our wide variety of connected drives there on screen. So again, lovely degree of connectivity. So let's begin the initial testing there of all of these uh, devices, but primarily targeting, of course, uh, the storage media. If we go to the target disk, we can go ahead and select that internal Sabrent drive there, and we're going to go for a 1080 file there. We're not going to go to 5K red quite yet, and we're going to go for a nice 256 meg, one gig file there, open up the charts, and immediately we're seeing that write speed be affected. And a lot of that write speed is due to all of those other devices being connected. There is, of course, the dent that's being made by OBS here in the background, but unfortunately, write is gonna be affected as, as mentioned earlier on, the device is sharing a lot of the connectivity there. Now, presumably, this spike in performance uh, we've seen and that change is due to different devices kind of leveraging the availability of that bandwidth between the whole device you can see it all there if we open it up the percentage utilization and of course disk 2 is the one we're accessing right now because it's so high but then all of these other things are getting their own kind of chunks being made out of them and again they've all appeared here with all of these different drives being listed now on here we've got all of those connected via the docking station and again that performance may not be as high as you hoped with that ssd but again that is because we're connecting all of these other devices so if we ramp things up to four gig test file and we'll make it down to the heaviest 5k we're going to see what sustained performance is like and it seems like bandwidth as it's being partitioned against all these other devices is having this effect so now while we're attacking this drive, why don't we open up uh, another application, a lovely popular one known as Black Magic, and then from there, select one of the other target drives. So if we choose to, this time we're going to go for uh, the Arico external enclosure there. And we're going to do a one, uh, we're not going to do one gig, we're going to, yeah, one gig test file there simultaneously as it's connecting to that other drive in the docking station. So we're still getting 800, 700 megs, but do factor in, of course, that all of this is happening with my own internal SSD. So even though we are attacking two different external drives, they're all working with my internal SSD, which can form something of the bottleneck. So now while it's doing those, why don't I open Atto Disk Benchmark and then from here select another new drive. And this time we're going to go for the E drive, which if we make our way back into uh, Crystal Disk, we can see that the E drive is that external sand disk drive there. So this time we're going to go for a 256 meg test on that drive. And that's going to take just an extra few seconds to kick up. But once again, 
bear in mind that all of these are happening simultaneously. So even though each drive on its own may seem like it's not quite hitting the heights that you would have liked to have seen from a drive, it's worth remembering that these drives are all being accessed at exactly the same time via that four, uh, 40 gigabits per second connection. Now, um, Atto Disk Benchmark is going to take a little bit more time in order to get the job done, largely because it's testing those smaller file types. Later on, it will build into the hundreds, maybe even thousands of megabytes. But while it's doing that, why don't we put the boot in one last time? Let's open up uh, my D drive here. This is an external SATA SSD there, so there is the potential for a bottleneck there. And we're just going to go grab some of my uh, WMV files there, click copy, and then from there go back into my computer. And now we're going to select another drive to dump things into there. So from here, we're going to make our way into the new volume, and then from there into the Plex folder, and then from there start copying that. So now we've got another transfer happening simultaneously, all of which to the same uh, via the same port on all three of these. We're accessing all of these drives, and yes, no single one of them is providing us with 40 gigabits per second. But what's crucially important here is we are accessing all of these drives at exactly the same time from my internal M2 NVMe, and we're still getting arguably very impressive performance speeds. Yes, this one on the left is using an M2 SSD. This one on the right is using an external um, uh, uh, M2 SSD. And the top volume there being uh, an external uh, uh, USB SanDisk SSD at 10 gigabits per second. And the bottom one is a traditional hard drive. So these performance figures are quite normal. But if you add up all of the bandwidth that's happening right now, we are still fully saturating that connection. All the while, of course, with our individual network connections there also being open to us. It's a great little docking station that's allowing a lot of widespread connectivity there to be possible. But what about if we cancel all of these operations and then from there, coming out of them all, this time we test an SSD on its own. So for now, what we're going to do is stop there, come out of that, come out of that, come out of that. And I am going to just turn the power off, but I just strongly recommend if you are doing something like this, that you ensure that you safely disconnect everything. But for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to safely disconnect all of this enormous number of devices that we've got listed there. I'm just going to disconnect. And then as these devices are all disconnected one by one, all I'm going to do is leave in the original connection, but disconnect every single device with the exception of that internal M2 SSD. So now all we've got is the internal M2 SSD and we have got it connected via, turning the power on, sorry I stepped away from the mic, um, all we're going to do is give it an extra second or so until it reconnects our drive and as you can see this time it immediately recognized that that drive was connected and if we run a rescan sorry about the fans of my laptop they're starting to creep up quite substantially we can see that now it's just listing that rocket plus so let's do a quick test on that drive so as you can see as we perform the test moving forward we are seeing that read performance get substantially higher now unfortunately we are going to see lower write numbers for a couple of reasons one because now we are so fully saturating that 40 gigabits per second connection there that we're not leaving much left over 40 gigabits being four gigabytes or 4000 megabytes you can probably do the math there on screen. And of course, we also have to factor in my own internal SSD here having to be leveraged against that. Now, again, if we look at the Atto Dismart test I did earlier on, we see not dissimilar results. We can see there that read reached as high as 4.56 gigabytes per second. Now, bear in mind, this does use the traditional mathematic formula, and that is really just the full saturation of that connection. So it was really 
4.5, it was more likely uh, equivocable to 4,100 um, 4, or 4,200. But as you can see, due, for, due to the oversaturation of the cache and just general bandwidth availability problems, you can see that it did scale all the way down as space was becoming more limited. But with just a single drive inside and not connecting all those other devices, we were able to really capitalize on that full bandwidth that's available to you utilizing this docking station. And that's really it. I think this docking station certainly does exactly what it promises. Yes, like a lot of Thunderbolt devices in the market, I think they should perhaps be a little bit more honest about what 40 gigabits per second connection translates to in reality with regards to media because this being the bandwidth doesn't necessarily guarantee that your devices will hit it it really does come down on the media but everyone and i'm talking from apple mac all the way down to this company's biggest competitors in the likes of uh, subrent and Sonnet all do that same thing. But ultimately, as a docking station, this does exactly what it says it will do. I just wish I had an 8K monitor in order to show off that feature of its abilities. But this has been my review of the S2 from Arico, and I recommend you check it out. If you want to learn more, there should be links in the description. Click like if you've enjoyed the video, subscribe if you want to learn more. And as we cover this subject more and more, specifically with this docking station, maybe comparing it against the one that we featured on the channel recently, um, then do, don't, uh, do not forget to subscribe. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.